Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadriando. I'm your host, Marcy. And today, I'm joined by an awesome guest. Her name is Liz, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Lisette, and I am a third of El Salon Chronicles. I'm a, a social worker who specializes in psychiatry, and I'm also a mom and a friend and a sister and a daughter and all that good stuff. <laughs> and also one of my comadres. Um, yes, I'm a comadre. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So today's topic is narcissists and how they affect others. And the reason why the topic came up is that we've been seeing a lot of media coverage regarding narcissists and um, like in social media and also with the situation that's going on right now that we're going to discuss later. Um, and I feel like it's a topic I want to discuss because I was in a relationship with a few narcissists and I want to be able to help people recognize the signs and like kind of learn how to deal with them because it's not necessarily that it's not nece you're not necessarily going to avoid them in your life. But if they are in your life, how do you deal with them, right? In a positive yeah. way that doesn't drain you. So before we get into the nitty gritty, um, we're just going to get some of the preliminaries out of the way. What is your profession? I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a licensed clinical social worker with an R psychotherapy privilege, which basically is a lot of letters to say that I can do everything that a psychiatrist does except prescribe medication. <laughs> In the simplest term. Awesome. So how long have you done this? So I've been practicing psychotherapy for about 20 years in different capacities. So um, I graduated from Fordham University, uh, the Graduate School of Social Service. And um, I then, I was a police officer actually first in New York City. And then I retired and I went into the field of social work. And I've been working in different areas, uh, inpatient, outpatient, substance abuse, um, administrative, and, and, you know, working with children and adults. I've pretty much done it all, except I've never worked in a hospice uh, uh, situation by choice. I, I just, um, that's just too hard. I mean, everything is so hard, but just knowing that it's everything is end of life, I've chosen on purpose not to engage in that type of work. And then also um, with um, child protective services. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see a lot of it in my practice um, as a, like a third party, if you will, but never in the capacity, other than when I was a, co a police officer, never in the capacity of actually going and, and seeing all the atrocities that happen to children. I actually see it on the, as, as with a lot of adults. And as they talk about their trauma and their adverse childhood experiences, I end up coming in contact, but going into a home and removing a child and seeing that graphic part of it, um, like I said, other than when I was in law enforcement, I've chosen to stay away from that. Yeah, that's a hard, that's a hard field to go in. Like even um, yeah. before I was a teacher and before I was working in the bank, I used to work as a family worker. And um, yeah. it was always like, you know, it's so easy for people to, it's people to jump to conclusions about parents, but like, mm -hmm. you know, I would always give everybody the benefit of doubt and like, you know, really, really try to listen to um, right. what's going on and, and give as much help as possible because that that's like, I feel like that's the last resort unless you see yeah. something that's like really like jarring and the, the, the child will not be able to, you know, be able to survive in that kind of situation. Well, you know, it's interesting because especially in New York City, but I think across the board, we have moved from a a society, well, from, a, a, I guess, a, a world of removal where everything was removal to now, you know, helping families stay intact, helping parents uh, learn parenting skills and, and adjust to whatever the environment, because sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's difficult. You may be dealing with your own stressors. It's not that you want to be a quote unquote bad parent or neglectful parent, but you may not have the tools or the skills. Uh, and of course, I'm separating that from the people who use drugs. And although that also is, is, is an issue, but from people who uh, deliberately impart uh, uh, pain and 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 hurt onto children. Um, there are people who just need a helping hand, 
And so to your point, yes, listen, what are your circumstances that prevent you? What are the barriers that prevent you from being able to? And then, you know, the lines get blurred because some children that should definitely be removed don't. And we end up, you know, seeing the situation in the news, you know, so. Yeah. So um, getting into that, like, because I feel like this kind of is a good segue. Um, a lot of the times uh, there's people are able to mask. So this is one of the things that I've learned about narcissistic, narcissistic personality disorder, right? They're able to mask and appear like they have it all together or that they're a good person in society. But then in behind closed doors is another thing. So I feel like that the masking part is, is, is a lot of the, um, the issue with that, right? With the kids that don't get removed in situations that they should be getting removed. Right. Um, so first, I, I really want to separate two things out because a lot of times, and it's it's not by anyone's fault, but we throw a lot of words out and sometimes we, you know, we really don't understand what it what it means. So first and foremost, there's a difference between being uh, being a narcissist and having a narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah, there's a difference between that. them. Right. OK, so. Um, an individual with uh, a diagnosis, and by the way, I just need to preface it by saying that their you know, research doesn't show the amount of people that are diagnosed with a disorder because by virtue of your grandiosity and everything, you don't have a problem, right? So mm -hmm. you don't go seek, yeah. sir, you don't go, you know, you have a heart condition, you feel depressed, you, you, you have mood swings, you go see a psychiatrist, but me, I'm, I'm the best thing that happened out there. What the fuck I need to go see a doctor for? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at the research, the percentages are really low, but it does not really speak to the level of individuals or the amount of individuals that are diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. So the disorder piece, and this goes along with any, uh, any mental health diagnosis, is connected to an inability to function, right? So it's your level of, of narcissism, and we'll talk about the, you know, the seven main traits because there, it's so multi-layered, uh, but there are seven main traits that you'll see in somebody. And then it just becomes, you know, there's like a whole bunch of layers, like an onion. Um, this individual who's diagnosed with a narcissistic personality disorder, it starts affecting their ability to function in life, their ability to work, their ability to have, and, and most, you know, when you're a narcissist, you don't have really have, you have a, a, a difficult time having relationships. But um, in the disorder piece, again, it's about an impact in your ability to function in every aspect of your life. When you are a narcissist, you shine and you are the corporate guru. You are the, the personality of all personalities. You, 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 you thrive because that's what it's about. So you're able to function in life. You may be extremely wealthy. You may be the best movie star. You may be uh, uh, the corporate corporate uh, uh, guru or whatever it is. So you're able to function by virtue of your narcissism. So that's the difference between the two. Um, do you want me to go on? <laughs> no, that's perfect. Um, so okay. yeah, so they, they, they're usually like that person that's like, everybody's like, oh my God, they're so successful. They're doing so well. But then, like, usually you meet one or two people that, like, if you really got to know this person, you wouldn't be saying these things about that person. Yeah? Correct. Correct. And you would be like, oh, Marcy, you are so lucky to have your husband. He's so successful and he gives so much to the community. And at home, he's berating you and belittling you and all yeah. this other stuff. And you're like, yeah, you I don't know, know them behind closed doors. And, you know, we'll talk about it later. Mm. But that particular person mm. is, you know, it, there are different names for all like four types and i guess we'll get into that a little later but you're absolutely right at the fa yeah so you know what the person may be demonstrating in public uh is not necessarily what's happening behind closed doors so the 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 narcissist in public will be very successful be very engaging and 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 just just seen to everybody as just a wonderful personality and then behind closed doors to the people that that are in their lives they're horrible 
they're very toxic. So I wanted to touch on that. Um, so the narcissist that I've dealt with, um, really good friend to other people. So like outgoing and like would give their last and to their friends and stuff like that. Not necessarily successful in the sense of like monetarily or anything like that, but um, you know, like really kind of like everybody's like, oh, this person's so great, blah, 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 you know. But then behind closed doors to their partner, absolutely disgusting, like really mean, mean spirited, like um, calling them out of their name and things like that. So I wanted to ask a question. I know that we have like a set of like stuff that we're going to talk about, but I wanted to do a sidebar. Does narcissism go hand in hand with abuse a lot of the time or not so always? So part of being a narcissist is being abusive. Uh, so there, there are four types of narcissists, right? Um, one is the, is, is the worst type, and that's the malignant, the toxic person, which is pretty much what you're describing. So this person is the individual who's going to belittle you. You are less than. Um, and what happens is it's almost... You know, I, I, I listen to Dr. Ramani, who's who's amazing, and she calls it like secondhand smoke. So you end up believing these things that you're worthless, you're less than, you're no good. And what's embedded in a narcissism, in a narcissist, is the fact that, and we'll talk about later, how do you become a narcissist, right? Um, that it's about lack of self-esteem. It's about not feeling worthy. So in turn, you need to put this onto someone else. And that becomes this toxic, malignant uh, narcissist. The other one is the, the benign narcissist where they, they're not hurtful because you have to understand the, uh, in, in order to be a narcissist. So let's go back a little bit um, and talk about some of the seven traits of a narcissist, right? Cause we said, um, yeah. The narcissist, narcissist, narcissistic personality disorders and inability to function in your world, but then there's a narcissist and they have traits. So they lack empathy, right? Uh, care for anybody. And if you think about it, some of the most successful people in the world wouldn't have gotten there without stepping on somebody. You don't get ahead mm -hmm. in the world. And unfortunately, that's what society, be, um, you know, uh, uh, in parts because we live in, in an achievement oriented culture where you are judged, right? By your things and not so much by, oh, you're a good person. Okay. So it's more important. And, and, you know, your, your status depends on the car you drive and the purse you have and all of this. And we're all guilty of it to some extent. Right. Some of us like it because we just like the, mm -hmm. the, the nicer things, but other people get it because they want other people to see what they have. Right. So then there's the sense of entitled lack of empathy. You don't care about others. Um, and empathy is learned in childhood. So we'll talk about that when we talk about how it happens. Um, there's a sense of entitlement. So I deserve this mm -hmm. no matter what over anybody. Right. Then there is grandiosity. Right. So number three, grandiosity. Everything is huge and big and you know you didn't just have a little pea size pea no your pea was bigger than everybody's and everything and you went to the best schools and everything that everybody says you want up them right so that's oh grandiosity uh <laughs> Wait, you're reminding me of the orange guy that was like... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, continue, hey listen a lot of this will resonate you know and, and these are how you start to see um, cause you might say, oh, my person, uh, the person that I'm with, they're not narcissists. They don't lack empathy, but they have all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, number four is superficiality, the inability to really connect on a deeper level. Everything is superficial and based on what can you do for me? I don't really care about being your friend. It's just that being your friend is going to get me the tickets to go see whomever. Right. So there's a lot of superficiality in the way you relate with people. And I use the word relate very loosely because connected to narcissism is the really the inability to have good relationships. Mm. Um, number five is the chronic seeking of validation. 
you need 24 seven. So we all as human beings love to be told you 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 did an amazing job, right? But when you wake up and every function of your day is predicated on being praised and being validated. And again, we go back to the society that we live in. Uh, if you're going to be on social media, you're going to make it depending on the amount of likes, right? So Spotify or YouTube or whatever, the way they see that you're a viable, uh, I guess, candidate for lack of a better word is, oh, this person has 50 million followers, not the person that has two. So in some ways, depending on your path in life, you almost have to be that way because that's part of it. But if you wake up and you live and eat and breathe to be validated and praised, that's an issue. Um, we'll go back to that because I'm going to talk to you how it presents in the classroom with students, like what I see from an early age, from like pre-K age. But then we'll, we'll circle back to that. So just let's finish up this part. Right. Okay. And so then there is arrogance, right? And it's the basic definition of, of arrogance. You know, you're an arrogant individual. Um, and, and so those are some of the, the, the traits that you'll see in an individual who is a narcissist. No, that's crazy. It's crazy. Like that validation part is so, cause I understand it in children. Like they want to be told that they're doing a good job, but there's some children, wait, there's not your plane passing by. There's a plane. <laughs> and it's so loud. Oh, and I forgot. I forgot one other aspect. Okay. Rage. Rage. Mm -hmm. So rage is a component, is a trait that you will also see because, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the causes, um, one of the issues is an inability to regulate your emotions. You become easily frustrated uh, when you don't get the things that you want when your manipulation, you know, and usually, you know, you get what you want as a narcissist, but um, when it doesn't go the way you want, it manifests itself in rage. And so you become enraged um, and rage is, like I said, one of the, uh, one of the, the traits that you'll see. And again, all of these things go back to parenting, right? So back to the types. So there's the malignant type, the toxic type. We already talked about that. There's the benign type. And the benign is just, oh, I just want the good things. And if you bring it to their attention and you say, you know, that's not very nice that you said that, they'll be like, oh, you know, you're right. I, I shouldn't have said that, but I really want that, right? And benign because they're not really trying to hurt anybody, but they have all these other traits and they, they function in life in that way. Then you have the covert. So you want to look at like the Eeyore of Winnie the Pooh. Oh, life is horrible. Life is not good. You know, and you may think that they're depressed because some of, some of the traits mask themselves. You can cross over into depression or anything like that. But they walk around with this woe is me situation. Bruh, you just exploded <laughs> my dream. <laughs> and, and, you know, and they'll be like, oh, I went to NYU, but you don't really care about that. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares about that. Right. And that's the covert because I'm oh wanting God. to, for you to get, and you're going to respond with, Oh no, Lisette, that's great that you went to NYU. You went to Harvard. What do you mean? That's nothing. I'm like, no, nah, it's okay. It's not a big deal. It's, it's not a big deal. You know? Um, and then <laughs> they can't even, they can't even see me. my mouth is like all the way on the floor, guys. I know. Oh and then the last one is the communal narcissist. So that's the person that everything they do that's benevolent is posted. So I woke up today, Marcy, I fed the hungry today. I want you to know that I went and I fed the hungry and I did it from nine to five. And Marcy, did you know I did it again? Did you know? Did you know? Wait, I did it. So that guy, that guy that posts the videos of him giving money to homeless people, is that part? It's, like, it, it, so you know, little. yeah, yeah, you would be because... You know, what is the point in all of that? Why don't you just do it anonymously? Um, you know, and it's not to say that that's bad in and of itself, right? Because, you know, uh, our Salon Chronicles, we've given to the community. We, we participate in certain things and we put it out there. 
so that people can see that, you know, we're doing good things in the community and basically, you know, to try and garner uh, help or whatever for that cause. But if you wake up every day and everything that you do for somebody else or anything that you do is posted on social media or you have to let everybody know 15 times a day, mm -hmm. right? Um, then that's where you want so that's where you to have an line. issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who was it? Was it an actor? Was it Denzel Washington? I think Denzel Washington pays off somebody's like complete like student loan debt or whatever. I believe it was the, the actor guy who that passed away, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, he paid off his debt. But the thing is, he did that, but he wasn't looking for. Oh my god, that airplane sounds really good. Yeah, he actually they um, said it in his speech. Um. Uh. uh oh my gosh, and I. I Chad Chadwick Boseman. Boseman. There we go. He said it in his speech. America, ¿qué está pasando? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but yeah, That's like, okay. but the thing is, Denzel didn't do it to get the recognition. Chadwick Boseman said it in his speech because he wanted to recognize Denzel. It wasn't that Denzel was like, yo, I'm about to drop this rack and this guy's bank account and pay for his stuff, you know? It's a completely different right. um thing. So I feel like yeah. there's a thin line there, too. But I feel like, yeah, no, I definitely see that. Like, there's people that are like, oh, my God, did you see? I'm literally like Mother Teresa. I'm out here working. That's the difference. I'm, yes. I'm, in, I'm in these third world countries and I'm feeding the poor. And look at me and these and look at me. And everybody's like, oh, my God, you're so amazing. Uh, but they're well, doing because it you need for that. that validation. It's not that they're doing exactly. it because they're coming out of the goodness of their heart or to garner, you know, support from other organizations that can support the work that you're doing. Correct. And remember, validation is a big part of it. So if I give you a pencil as a gift, you're going to need to thank me for the rest of my life for that pencil that you get, that I gave you, you know, and it's almost oh like, God. you know what? Keep your fucking pencil. So <laughs> exactly. But it all stems down to your feelings of self-worth and your your need for validation, which happens in childhood. Yeah, like touching on that, like um, I want to get into some of the behaviors that I see in, in pre-K. It's, it, it, and I don't know, because a lot of the time before I like make a judgment of a child, obviously I'm not going to be like, oh my God, this kid's a jerk and a narcissist. I'm like looking at the behavior. And basically, you, you said, I'm sorry, you said a good term there. Basically, narcissist is a fancy word for saying you're a jerk. <laughs> You're just an asshole of a person. That's what it is. <laughs> but we like to put it up in a nice bow so and call it narcissist. Yeah, so, uh, uh, like, you know, I look at the behavior and I'm just like, okay, you know. And then, like, I start finding things out. I'm like, okay, it's a child and only child. Um, what's the home situation like? Is a parent neglectful? Is a parent this and that? Whatever. So I can kind of get, like, a profile of what the child is like and then kind of understand the need for the valid, the constant validation because it's not one thing. And then the, the these kids tend to do this thing, which I don't know if you've seen, but the kids go on and like, let's say you praise another student for doing something right. Ooh. Girl, they're like, but what about no. me? <laughs> exactly. And I understand the babies, but then when I see the fifth graders doing it, I'm just like, yo, like, you know that just because I'm giving praise so this child does not invalidate you or does not mean right. that you're not doing a good job. But I just so happen to be pointing out the fact that Johnny's doing a good job right now at this moment, you know? So it's like, I don't know how to, ha sometimes I don't know, like sometimes I'm pretty good in a good headspace, but sometimes I don't know how to handle it. And it's kind of like, uh, okay, I guess I'll praise you too. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, yeah. Well, listen, you know, you, you guys, you teachers are, are godsend. You know, and especially the ones like you that are paying attention, you know, reading and writing is not everything, right? I mean, yes, it's important, but being able, especially the kids that are being raised in society today with everything that's happened, especially in the last two years with the isolation and everything, it's, it's really a tough job. And I praise all teachers um, because you guys are able to see things in ways that other people don't. And I always considered myself um, an extension of the teacher, even though I'm the yeah, parent, definitely. you know? And I always said to the teachers, I want to co-parent with you because you're seeing my child eight hours a day 
or whatever the situation is. And you're seeing the child in, in, in a, a social situation, individual situations, and you are, and I, we need to do this together. That's how I approached it. Um, but really, you know, I want to speak to the parent, the new parents out there because my kids are 15 and 17. And, you know, one of the big, the best things that I feel I did for them is teach them to be empathic. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. So important. I, I realize it now because when I had them, I was still in law enforcement and I wasn't knee deep in the profession that I am in now. But I realize it now because my children truly care about other people. Yes, I academics are important and, and all this other stuff, but our emphasis, my ex-husband and I, and, and we, we co-parent today, uh, every day. And our emphasis is on empathy because that leads to being a good human being when you care about others more than you care about what's happening with you. My son got detention the other day for something that he didn't do um, because he refused to tell who it was that did it, you know? And I, I said, hey, listen, I'm going to respect that and I'm going to allow you to make that decision. He's like, mom, you know, he's in a more compromised situation and, you know, detention for me is not going to be a big deal, but if he gets detention, it's going to be, you know, and I'm just not going to tell. And I, and I said, you know what, I'm very proud of you and I'm going to mm -hmm. follow your lead and I'm going to let it go. Um, and, and that was his decision that, and, and he, and, and I, that, and so, you know, he could have said, F it, I'm not doing it. I'm putting you out on front street. And that's just one example of what happened. So empathy is very important. Um, narcissists, are most often made. You're not necessarily born a narcissist, okay? Individuals with a narcissistic personality disorder, it's possible that there's a genetic component, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the only reason that they're not considered psychopaths, if, if you will, is because they may say, mm, yeah, that's not right, but I'm going to do it anyway because I need to get mine. Whereas a psychopath would be like, I don't even understand why that's a problem. <laughs> why Why is it is there any human connection, emotional connection to it? So there's they like a, that, very right? slight, a very slight difference between a psychopath and, and, a, and a narcissist? But so, you, know, you want to say it's 90-10, right? So here's here's the thing when it comes to how do you, how, how does someone become a narcissist? Well, this happens in childhood. You know, there are times where, you know, a parent may invalidate the individual um, or back. validate too much. Um, and that's sort of some of the things that Marcy may be seeing in, in her classroom, right? Where there's a constant need for validation. And that's because when this child in the residence in, in, at home, um, they were never validated. They were never told, you know, wow, you made the best bed ever, or it was just way too much. So anything in, in the extreme. So from a parenting perspective is invalidating or overindulging a child. Wow. You know? So it has to be like right in the middle, like the right of Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think that before anybody becomes a parent, we should go to parenting classes, you know, because there's so many things that we Hell could yeah. learn. <laughs> Um, it's a lot. I mean, people go to puppy learning classes to get a puppy. You know, you go to, you buy a house, you learn, you go on YouTube, but you learn. Does anybody go and learn how to be a parent? It just, you think, you know, you have all these little personalities running around. So there's that. Then you have, you know, um, children mirror what they see, right? And if you don't teach your child how to regulate their emotions by the way you regulate your emotions. Remember, if 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 a, a plate breaks and the world falls apart and your child is watching mm. you fall apart because a plate broke, that's how they're going to relate when something happens in their lives as insignificant as a plate breaking, right? 
And so how you, so there's a lot of modeling and mirroring. So we have to really look at what we're showing our children by our behaviors. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, we have to really look at what are we bringing to the table, right? So are we bringing insecurities? Are we bringing, because that's what we're going to impart onto our children. Um, and, and, you know, we live in a society where healthy attachments sometimes don't exist. Being able to, you know, so there's the family piece and there's a society piece. Society, like I said earlier, values material things. And we have to combat our parenting with that. And then there's the, the, the family parts. And building healthy attachments with our children will teach them to have healthy relationships in the future. So that's how we end up creating these, the narcissists. If you speak to someone who's a narcissist, you know, when I talk to people, I always, in my psychotherapy sessions, I always go back to, tell me about your childhood. And they're like, yeah, but I'm having marital problems now. And I said, I understand that, mm. but let's talk about your childhood, right? Because we are a product of our experiences. And if we only learned how to scream and yell every time something went wrong, well, that's what we're going to do in our relationships. That's, you know, that's there's somebody in my childhood that um, well, I'm not like that. But the let's say they're cooking and they're making oatmeal, let's say, right, like Dominican oatmeal on the stove and right. they turn on the milk and the milk boils over and it spills. It was like a whole big production. Right. And then I'm looking at that person's parent and the parent does the same exact thing. You're going to see the patterns as opposed to, oh, fuck, now I got to clean this stove and keep it moving. The world fell apart. Everything's yeah. done. And then the thing is, because I was around that person a lot when I was a kid, I I, I was reacting like that for a while uh -huh. until yeah. I started catching myself. And I'm like, is this a big deal or a little deal? And this is like literally my magic phrase that i use with all my students is this a big deal or a little deal because you know exactly. working with kids on the spectrum they 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 have a hard time um emotionally regulating right so yes. teaching them like hey is this a really a big deal or is it a little deal are we going to keep it moving um even with my son i teach like he would fall on the floor and i remember seeing other parents like oh react and the kids would like start yeah. bawling and then I would see him fall and I'd be like, hey, are you okay? He's like, he'll dust himself off and get up. He's like one foot or two foot nothing and be like, I'm okay. And, then, and just keep it moving and keep going. You know, like, and, and then I feel like that helped him a lot with regulation of emotion. Cause um, the yeah. tantrums after he was like three or four were like reduced to the point that they're like almost non-existent now. So I feel like exactly. that that is very helpful as well. Well, yeah, oh my so kids! I had to, I had to I see, it. I had to see blood. I had to see blood. I was like, I'm sorry. Am I seeing blood? No. All right, you're gonna be okay. I love you because you don't want to be detached, right? No, of course. You're gonna yeah. be like, oh honey, you're gonna be. You, uh, there's no blood. We're good. Let's go. Let's so keep it moving. I love you. Hug. Let's go. Keep it. Keep it going. <laughs> and the thing is, is that you know, it makes it very makes my job as a psychotherapist very difficult because how do you teach a 30 year old empathy? How do you teach a 30, 40 year old? Um, emotional regulation. It's hard. It's very, very hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And it, you know, how do you undo 30 years of something? And then you have to throw in the fact that they have to be willing to put in the work to do the change, right? Yeah. Because remember a narcissist, there's nothing wrong with them. That's a trait. It's a personality trait. I'm there's nothing wrong with me. It's you that's the problem. I don't need to seek help. So I'm not going to seek help on how to not be this way. Mm. A lot of times, I you know, if someone comes to me because they're dealing with depression or anxiety or whatever, we end up talking about narcissistic traits. <laughs> because they're like, "What do you mean?" And I'm like, "So, let's talk about this." And I'm like, "But I came to you for this." And I said, "I understand that, but let's talk about this." <laughs> You know, because a lot of things can be masked in, in, in different ways. And, you know, it's, it's just hard. It's hard. And so in your classroom, when you see these behaviors, you ask, how do I, how do I engage? 
you know, um, how do I deal with it? For a teacher, my recommendation would be to have a conversation with the parent. I don't know to what level you guys are allowed to, yeah. you know, and, and, and really, you know, I'm seeing this type of behavior because some parents based on their own upbringing, you know, we all say, I want to give my child everything that I didn't have. Right. And so we overindulge. And when we overindulge, then we create a sense of entitlement. Right. And we have to, it goes back to us again. I have to make peace with the fact that I've been working since I was 13, 14, 15 years old, functioning in my house, like most of us or whatever, because my parents, you know, they didn't speak English. They, you know, we had, there was a lot of different things. My children have two college educated parents who speak the language or whatever. So do I need to have them struggle? And I'm guilty of it myself. I've overindulged and my family has said, Lisette, you're giving your kids too much. They're going to have a sense of entitlement. And so I've dialed back on that, you know, even as of four years ago. So there is, you know, you can take correction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can, uh, a corrective approach in, you know, as you move along and, and dial back. But in the beginning, at the base of everything was me teaching them empathy. So it was easy for me to take a corrective approach and be like, you know what? It's okay if they don't have the best sneakers in the world, um, they're going to live. They need to know that it has to be earned and, and all of that. So as yeah. a teacher, I would, I would definitely have a conversation with the parents and keep that in mind. And I know that you have to, you know, language is very important because, you know, people get offended and want to feel like you're attacking their parenting skills. But I'm seeing this little Johnny consistently needs me to tell him that he's good. Can you tell me what's happening in the home? Are you seeing the same thing? Are you the type of person that if he, you know, moves a P to the left, you may make a party. So yeah. maybe let's dial back that. Let's dial I, that back I, a little bit. I teach my students to celebrate each other. So like, let's say I'm giving praise to the other kid and that one kid, um, I usually make them in charge of like the celebration committee. Like, oh, you get to leave the chat for fulanito de tal. And of course I praise them when they need to be praised, but it's like, you know, all of us can shine. Like just because one person is shiny doesn't take away from your light which is usually Correct. how I operate as well. And that's yeah. good. But but listen, as an adult in a relationship, so nobody wants to be in a relationship with a narcissist because it's exhausting. Okay. Um, it's, it's very exhausting and it can take a toll on you in the sense of, you know, gaslighting, it, you know, that's one, that's a big piece. You end up thinking like, wow, am I really, did I really do that? Or maybe I really am fat or maybe I, I'm not successful. You might excuse me, my achievements aren't this way. You'll end up believing some of that stuff. So the recommendation, whether it's an intimate relationship or uh, a friendly relationship, um, don't defend your actions. Don't ever defend your actions. Stand firm because what you're going to find is you're going to have one person with all this negativity, but around all your other friends, you're going to be like, Marcy, you look beautiful today. Um, or you did this today, just as nice or whatever, and uplifting you. Cause we, we always, especially in Comadriando, El Salon, Happy Her, we always want to surround ourselves with validating females and people who are uplifting and positive. And then you go home and this person's telling you, what the fuck you wearing all that makeup for? You look like shit today. The answer is, uh, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. So uh, I, I wouldn't like sidebar a little bit like kind of I remember giving birth in the hospital and um you know I'm feeling like empowered and then everybody's like coming to visit me and they're like oh my god you look so beautiful blah 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 and then the person that I was with makes a joke that to be careful that I don't fall off the bed because I'll make a hole to the first floor that should have been I, your first sign <laughs> I, no I mean that, that was like part of it but the, it, it was to the point the thing is like with the gaslighting and living with a narcissist you get used to this abuse, right? Yeah, and it's not yes. physical abuse, right? So there's people that are like, "Oh, what are you complaining about? He never put his hands." A hundred percent, a hundred. It's not a big deal. Get over it. Yeah, because like, you, you don't, you don't walk around with a bruise. He never yeah. put a hand on you, but like you know, undoing all that damage that I endured all that time that I was with that person, and it wasn't even that long. We were together for like what, like four years, but undoing that has taken me how old is my son? Four years. 
Four years is a lot. But, but Liz, how old is my son? My son is going to be 14. It took exactly. me like eight years to undo all of that. And yeah. still to this day, there's days that, you know, I'm not feeling, I'm not vibrating at my highest. And I, and I, and I start to have that little back, little voice back there. Like, mm-hmm. hmm, like you it's, know, it's imposter always syndrome. there. Kind of like, yes. oh, do you really think you're all that? Or do you really think you deserve this? And blah, 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 you know, stuff like that. But yeah, um, yeah. going back to so, what you were saying, listen. Don't defend your actions. Don't engage with the narcissist. Because here's the thing, you know, it's easier said than done when people say, well, just leave that relationship, right? And that's not always easy for someone to do, whether it's because of culture, finances, whatever the situation is. So if you are unable to leave that relationship, again, whether it's an intimate relationship, a family relationship, a friend relationship, if you're unable to, you know, get away from that relationship, these are some of the ways that you can help yourself while you're living in that situation. Don't defend your behaviors. Don't engage with the individual. Don't explain. And definitely don't personalize, right? Um, Classic narcissist, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. As opposed to, I'm sorry, I'm making you feel that way. So it's you're creating the situation. You're the one, right? And not, I'm not the one creating it. And we have to remember that, you know, at the base of all of this is self-esteem insecurity. So if we are insecure and we lack self-esteem, the narcissist can have a field day with you. Because they're preying on your insecurities. And that's what they live off of. And then there's a, there's a, uh, there's a period when you first get with a narcissist that they're basically grooming you to become this like meek, toned down version of yourself. I'm glad you said that. Let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. If I asked you, and we're friends, we're comadres. If I asked you for your password to your credit card, would you give it to me? No. Wouldn't you be like, well, why would you need that, Lisette? Like, what, no, what is that about? The answer is no. Like, well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's no conversation. How- <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to take that personal. I'm just saying. <laughs> like, yeah. And we guard our passwords to everything, but we don't guard our passwords to our psychological wealth. Yes. Right? So when we meet, and this is the part of the narcissist, they are, when we meet them, They're so engaging. And if we are vulnerable to the extent that our self-esteem isn't where it should be and we're insecure because of our past experiences, here comes now this very charismatic individual who presents loving and everything and my love. Tell me everything about you and we'll get through it together. And then we have diarrhea of the mouth. And we talk about all our vulnerabilities on fucking oh day two or day three. God, and we put it out there and there because we're seeing in this person and we need somebody to love us. And oh my God, they're so understanding. And then six months later, yeah, bitch, but you did this and I got you on this. And they'll, they'll use that against you. So folks, guard your psychology, your vulnerabilities, like you do your passwords or your punani or whatever. <laughs> You know, put Yo, that shit under lock like and key. For real, oh my god, it's it, uh, and it's so freaking like pervasive and toxic, and it's yes. just like yes. really like because it's like you know how you have layers of skin, right? You got the epidermis, mm-hmm. you got the endodermis, you got all the other shit, and then you got the stuff uh-huh. that's like right beneath, like right next to your muscle, like whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They get under there, and then the, it gets to the point psychologically that you're walking on eggshells to the point that mm-hmm. whatever the mood changes, you automatically assume it was something that you did. And then comes the piece where you're trying to, quote unquote, fix their mood to see what you can do and how you can make it better and how you can solve things. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Oh, my God. And the thing is, is that they prey on our vulnerabilities. And it's so important to really know yourself, know where you 
are insecure, where you're vulnerable because you are, a, 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 what do you call it? A, a prize for a narcissist because they will show, they will seemingly show empathy. They're, I care about you. I love you. And we gravitate to that. Wow, I have such a good person. They want to love me. Let me tell them all my little secrets. Yeah, mm -hmm. hook, line, and sink, or you're done. Jesus Christ. Okay, so there was something that you said in, was it in El Salon? In El Salon, right? In the, in the episode that just um, for the season finale, you said there's a difference between healthy narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. Can we like talk about what's, what's, what are the nuances of that? Okay, so I actually want to retract that statement. Okay. Okay. Um, because there really isn't healthy narcissism. When we, what I was really trying to say in, in the conversation was about, you know, being selfless and loving ourselves and putting ourselves first. So there's healthy, right. um, there, there, Exactly. There are ways where we can, it's okay to say no to somebody, you know, you need me today, but I'm, I'm in a space where I need to be quiet and I need to say no to you, Marcy today, right? That's healthy. Taking care of yourself. Um, and that's what I actually meant because when we say healthy narcissism, then we're saying we're validating the malignancy, the, 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 the manipulation, we're validating all these traits that are not healthy. So I want to separate those two words out. Got it. Um, and again, I want to separate also narcissism from narcissistic personality disorder, because when we talk about the disorder, we talk about an inability to function. The narcissist is able to function. They are able to attain everything that they attain at the expense of somebody else. So it's healthy assertiveness, healthy self-care by being able to say no to your friends and learning how not to feel guilty about that because you are important as well. And that's, that's the important piece uh, as far as that distinction between the three. All right. So we are seeing a lot of coverage about the Kim K and the, and the, and the Yeezy mm -hmm. issue. And um, honestly, like when I was reading her story and listening to the things that she's been through with him, and this is reserving the, the whatever I feel about Kim Kardashian, because I am not her biggest fan. I really am not. Um, there's a lot of things that she does that are problematic, and we're not going to get into that in this episode. But um, we'll be talking till tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like no, no, no shade on her, like whatever she had to do to get wherever she's at, that's cool. She can say yeah. whatever she needs to say. But there was um, something on the Daily Show that they were saying that she is, she was in an abusive relationship, right? And she's yes. trying to escape. And because of the way that this man is such a narcissist, she's finding it very hard. And the fact that she had children with this man is even harder because not like she has to interact with him for a certain amount of time. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you can get the courts involved and you can get a uh, order of protection. But um, one of our one of our ladies in, in, in the group chat, she said, that's just a piece of paper. It is, yeah. It's just a piece of paper. And, and, and the psychological effects that you have, you know, once you leave the relationship is really insane. Like, I was going through, you know, an order of protection. I was going through court and I was doing all these things. And I was like, so afraid of this person that I had to be physically separated from them until it was time to be in the courtroom with them. So it's like, you know, and I'm sharing a lot of, of my personal information, but it's it's really hard. Like it's, it's, you want the person to move on, but we have to take into account all the psychological aspects of it. And the fact that there was that grooming period and then that person was able to affect the other person's mood and self-esteem to the point that they're feeling like they're beneath the ground. And then now like they're working on building themselves up to get out, you know, and then yeah. actually having them realize also that, Hey, I have an issue. I need to seek help, you know, to right. get, yeah. out, to get out of that headspace. So, yeah. um, yeah. So do you, do you think that Ye or Ye or Kanye, whatever um, he's calling um, himself now? Um, I know. <laughs> do you think that he, has some aspects of narcissistic personality disorder? 
Yeah, we talked about it. And again, I've never met him. I've never interviewed him or anything like that. So I cannot speak from, uh, uh, you know, I can't speak legitimately. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but based on the behaviors, I definitely think there's a there's there's a couple of things happening. I think that there's a, a bipolar disorder uh, possibly taking place and more of, a, of the manic phase, which only serves to exacerbate the narcissism because narcissism has with it a, a, a piece of, of mania, right? Where you're constantly seeking this validation, the manipulation, this, this, that, whatever. Hence the and, tweets, right? Right. And then, you know, you have the, the bipolar. So when you have both of them, uh, it, it can be kind of, it, it, can, it can be problematic. And we also have to remember that, you know, Kim is a media figure. Her, her wealth and, her, and her, her continued wealth, I guess, and whatever, um, is predicated on her shows and putting her life out there and everything that they do. And that's how, you know, she makes the money now because I think she was born into money, right, or whatever. Um, I don't really follow them yeah, all that yeah. or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> but, that um, was like um, O.G. Simpson's yeah. lawyer or something. Yeah, something. yeah. But you have to give it to their mother because the mother was the brains behind all of this promotion and all this other stuff. And great for them. And But now that comes also with a cost in terms of uh, lack of privacy. I love Trevor Noah. I love The Daily Show. And he was so on point because we oftentimes think that because celebrities are allowing us to be in their living rooms, that we know them. And we have a false mm -hmm. sense of privilege or whatever. Like, I know what she's going through or this, mm -hmm. that, or whatever. Folks, you don't know any of these people. You don't know what they're going through. All you know is what you see on camera, right? And uh, like I said, I'm extremely happy that he said what he said because right now, you know, she is emotionally abused. And in addition, so are her children because what is it, two of them are older? I don't I don't follow yeah, them like that. So I think there there's there's it's four kids, right? It's four. Guys, don't quote <laughs> me on this. I'm sorry, we're not <laughs> Yeah, I, we're not and we're yeah, gonna use your term, not, we're not Kardashian watchers. But uh, we're not Kardashian watchers, but I think there's four, right? And but of the four, two are already yeah, older. And um, you know, this is now vicarious trauma because they're seeing, remember now they're, they're overindulged. I mean, some of these kids walk around with, I mean, I don't know what at age five, you're walking around with a $5,000 purse, but have at it. Yeah. You know? Um, so not that they are, I'm just saying. Um, so there's a lot of overindulgence happening. And now you have your life being played out, your parents' life being, being played out in the public. So there's a lot that is going to happen with the kids. And I hope that they're paying attention to that. I don't know what kind of a mother Kim is. So I'm not, I don't have anything to say about that. But I hope that they're as much attention as they're playing, paying on social media and all that. That they're also paying attention to the emotional well-being yes. of these children that are going to be adults in the future. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can say that... Um... And then the thing with the narcissist also, like, I see where, I understand the the family dynamics that caused them to become a narcissist. Um, but, you know, it's it's hard for them to see where they can break the cycle sometimes. And and not excusing, I'm not excusing their behavior at all, you know. Right. But um, the particular narcissist that I dealt with was, like, saw abuse in their family dynamic and it was like right. physical abuse you know so right. i'm not giving them a pass or anything like that but like you know because they are narciss uh, narcissists they didn't see that they needed to maybe heal that first before engaging in a in a relationship with somebody um you know an intimate romantic relationship with someone right and here's and here's the thing um in order for you to get help for something you have to recognize that something is happening. That's a problem. So exactly. <laughs> so it ends up being the responsibility of the loved one that's involved to, again, not engage, not explain, not personalize and don't defend and call them out and say, you know, 
Do you realize that today, on Tuesday, you needed validation 15 times? Let's talk about that, right? Or you could do like what I did and say, see you, bye. Yeah. <laughs> because I did the whole, um, are you listening to yourself right now? Are you yeah. refusing? Because I refuse to be gaslighted. I refuse. I am not, uh -uh. you're not going to tell me. No, I'm proud of my accounts. I do what I do, whatever. We're not going to mix. And so constantly calling out and saying, and then being told, oh, do you think you're a doctor now? Well, um, yeah, I'm a professional in my field. <laughs> Like, I'm stuck. Like, I don't know. Right. And then, though. right. Fortunately, though, I was in a situation where I was able to say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not, I'm not doing a build a man. Um, because here's the thing. There's a higher percentage of male narcissists than there are females. Why? Because of the way we're socialized. Yes. We live in a male, 2022, and we live in a male-dominated society, and men are, you know, you need to be the best at football, the best at this, the best at that, and da 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 So you grow up with that, and, you know, then you become a, a, a an adult human. And, you know, so, yeah, it's left to the partner to, to call it out and say, I love you, but you, I had to validate your feelings 15 times today. How do we fix this? And that's the only way that a narcissist will eventually come to realize that they need to make some changes, but at what expense to you? Yeah, like, yeah, it gets exhausting to be always, like, blamed for, you know, whatever is going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. And then it's hard to explain, like, hey, you're having issues at this many jobs with X, Y, and Z people. There's a common denominator in this situation. Oh, my God. Why are you talking about me, Marcy? Why are you talking about my situation? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you here? Because I actually said that. I was like, so there's been 15 jobs and everybody has a problem but you. Let's talk about that. I'll stop trying. See, the problem with me is that because whenever, <laughs> whenever I bring something to somebody's attention, I'm not trying to be your therapist. I'm just, I just know what I know. And so I'm pointing it out, but I always get back like, why are you trying to be a therapist? Don't try and diagnose me. I'm not trying to diagnose you. I'm just trying to tell you what I'm saying. <laughs> no, so I try, yeah. it's hard for me sometimes because I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to, I'm not, not that I'm always telling people or whatever, but you know, when people ask me, I'm going to speak from a place of knowledge. And, you know, it's like I, if I ask you about an educational question or whatever, or if I present a situation, you're going to speak from a place of knowledge because you're an educator. Yeah, I, I, I try not to, like, be like, well, you need this. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know. I've gotten very know. good at, like, putting it in a certain way so people don't feel, like, offended or taken aback or that I'm attacking them because it's so easy especially when you're talking about somebody's children to have somebody be yes. up in arms about something that you say you know and it's not yeah. and it's not it's never coming from a place like I'm judging you as a parent or your child it's more no. like hey how can we help your kid be good long term because like they're little mm -hmm. right exactly. now but eventually they're going to be adults and you know it's better to help now like let's yeah. say you see you, the thing you said about how do we teach a 30 something 40 year old empathy when they haven't yeah, been taught that their whole lives you know so exactly i i always come from a place of love and like thinking about what that person's gonna be like in in the future as an adult you know because they're cute and they're little now and but i think like little listen. baby napoleons is cute you know when they're five exactly four, but then when it's they're like older, a it's, it's like, like a chia like, pet you hell? put water it's like a chia pet you put water and they're blooming or whatever yeah, you know I mean, the kids are going to grow up to be adult, and what we do today is going to determine the type of adult that they are tomorrow. Yes. And with that, comadres, thank you so much for tuning in. And I want to thank Liz for coming on my show. I love it. Thank you so much. It was <laughs> such a good conversation. And besides, you can close like, your mouth now, Marcy. Know, you can right? close your mouth now. <laughs> Yeah, you guys need to hop on over to YouTube because, like, my facial reactions are, like, crazy. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> so I want to end the episode how I always do. Follow me at Comadreando Pod on IG and follow Liz at... 
El Salon Chronicles. Yeah, just okay. El Salon Chronicles. And if you have, uh, and then when you're sending a DM to El Salon Chronicles, or if you want to ask me, just make sure that you say, hey, Marcy, send this to Liz. Or if you're sending it to El Salon, yeah. just like make sure you're saying, this is a question for Liz. Um, and if you have any questions, don't feel free. Dica, don't feel free. Feel free to send me a comadre gram on uh, comadreando at esudenetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. And um, thank you. Slide. Slip and slide. <laughs> and thank you for spending time with your comadres. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. Bye.